1,800 miles, a three and a half hour flight to St. Louis, a three hour drive to Nauvoo. Nauvoo, the city beautiful. Nauvoo, the city of Joseph. Here we are at the Nauvoo house. It's Thursday evening. It's been raining since we got to St. Louis, but we're not worried. Let's take a look inside. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I have water. You have to skin the skin is tough to chew. Oh, seriously. Taco masters are busy. Alexis. A, uh, this is the men's floor. All right. Hang your clothes here. This is the men's floor here. Yeah. Any blood yet? No. Yeah, no. actually. Just a little. That's flinter. Yeah, Broken bones? Already. Huh? Oh, steep stairs. He's like, how'd you do that? You couldn't? That? That's a girl.
Friday, April 16th. Cool. The log cabin portion of this structure was acquired by the Mormons in 1839. The building had been constructed about 1805 and is the oldest home in Nauvoo. Joseph Smith and his family moved into it shortly after the 1839 purchase. It served as the prophet's home until the mansion house was completed. The kitchen and dining area of the homestead was built by Joseph Smith and the area was used as the administrative office of the church for several months. Our seminary teachers, Woo. Tom DeWitt, our guide. When the prophet moved his family into the mansion house in 1842, this study area of the home became the administrative office for the church. Oh, the wind. Where's my wind protector? There's Jenny and a uh, friend. And of the red brick store. <laughs> well, one time went a mile and a half or two miles to the east, two miles north and south here. So it started down here on the bend of the river and it ends up here on the bend of the river to the north. Is everybody ready to go? I'm Elder Jones from Malad, Idaho. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. 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 
Okay. Yes. Tell me the name of the horses, Sunny and what? Cher. Oh, Cher. It's Sunny and Clyde. It's Sunny and Sam. Sunny and Sam. Very close to Joseph, and Joseph wasn't able to talk at the funeral. But a few weeks later, they had a general conference right here in Nauvoo. There were 20,000 people right here in Nauvoo. The second carriage ride I brought up here, there was a gentleman on the back of the wagon, raised his hand, and I let him talk. He wanted to bear his testimony. He says, I'm a convert to the church. He said, I investigated a lot of religions, and none of them meant a thing to me. He said, I read the King Paulus sermon, and I was baptized three weeks later. He said, I recognize that no man going to talk for two and a quarter hours to 20,000 people. He said what Joseph Smith said about the great revelation of our father and him. So I like to relate that testimony to you folks as we go along. They're down here, uh, and that's the Mississippi. Of uh, this is a little bit further, and you can do it, but it's farther. farther. Okay. Miles wide. Oh, he's oh. talking about coming down a little. Is it, a mi is it only a mile? I Campbell. can every day. <laughs> she was yeah, married to. Uh -huh. That's nothing. Let's jog in. What did you guys have to and do? Then, Ten miles uh, a day. They had the level <laughs> error of their lives, and so why is no, his no, house up in town versus kind of back <laughs> over there? Um, <laughs> right there. Yeah. That's where she lived. I would drive the Well, he, he did. <laughs> <laughs> like, he was a lot of pioneers had two lines. Scattered settlers living along the river. Small flat area. as Church leaders bought ample tracts of land on the flat. William and White. And land speculators Isaac the Land and Everybody's coming out with something in the, both hands. <laughs> Cookies and. Did you get a? Oh, did you get a cookie? Oh, thank you, Bevis. Just a minute. Did you get? A you need to get oh, a cookie. That's right. No, no, thank no. You. Here, I'm here, Jeffrey. Well, I'm really trying to watch a. Sandy White. Oh yeah. Sandy White. Hey, well, you don't take it. it. I think because somebody out there okay. that they do not taste like the traditional. Yeah. They're good. They're is called a slider harmonica gun and he had 25 shots in the shot bar in this reach right here but he decided five was enough and so and then rotating cylinder in this pistol so he incorporated that into his oh, rifle yeah. huh. and then on the stock he put this plaque it says holiness to the lord our preservation he felt like guns were for um safety and for protection of the family and for, for providing food. And then this is Elizabeth's jewelry and Jonathan's watch. But he had a young son named John Moses Brownlee that lived in the blacksmith shop and those were his toys and he was in the gunsmith shop and he's the one who went on with learning what his father did plus and he he took out 128 patents with Winchester Arms, Remington Arms, Fabric National in Belgium, and Colt, and places like that. And it threw 200 times per rifle, and you can see the action of the twist there. Then they would move it down to the, another groove here, and continue to, to do it till they got seven rifles. And we do have a demonstration, or a thing to show here, and you can be looking around at some, and I'll tell you some of the other things in the shop, and this, you just look in and see the rifling up to the light or the window. Yeah. 
So you can kind of pass that around to look. Get through this and it's like their mascara brush. And I said, well, what, whatever <laughs> show. He was a pattern maker. Now he was able to make patterns for just about anything anyone wanted, so that made him a little bit higher than most of the tinsmiths here in Nauvoo. So he was in great demand. He had two journeymen and an apprentice working here, so there were actually four uh, people working in this small uh, room. Now I'm going to demonstrate to you how to make this pan. Now the process in making this pan was the same process with just about everything that's in this shop, so it was finished. With the four of them working together, it took them 15 minutes to make this pan, and it sold for between 10 and 12 cents when they were through. Printing office. See how they printed those pages. Times and seasons and Nauvoo neighbor. Set tight. Let's go in. I'm sure we're related. You know a lot of Yes, this is this is the actual size of it. And uh, it was a it was a church publication, and in fact, it was published in uh, England. Uh, some of the terminology we use on our computers and our typewriters were actually from centuries back when they had the uppercase, which was the capital letters, and they were arranged alphabetically. Then there was the lowercase, which had the smaller letters. And they were arranged according to the letters that are used the most. Want to read that for me? It's upside down. Let's, see, let's turn around and say, did that help any? No. <laughs> oh, wait, no, I can see yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, it's this way. Is it? Okay. He has a good idea. Use a mirror. Yeah. I know, seriously. Oh, oh wait, wait. We're, we're prepared. <laughs> Look, mine everywhere is, oh, decided. Lee hate, hated that public opinion is not inclined to do them common justice. Every bad... <laughs> well, that's great that we should have memorized that. Wow. Okay. Then this would be pulled down like this to, to print it. And then put back. Then it would be rolled back out. That was two pages at a time. Yeah. yeah. One and four. Wow. Okay, so this would be damp with ink, and so the apprentice would take it off, put a slip sheet between it, and hang them up here to dry. And wow. they would do that, and then it would be inked again and run through again. They'd do that 600 times. Just again. Then they would have sheets two and three ready to go, and they would print those on the back of yeah. this as it had dried. Yea, I will give unto you that which is more pleasing than milk and honey. Hey guys. Okay. Does that look good or what? Good. Great. Right. I'm hungry. on the table in pictures or something. Yeah.
The Mormon's epic journey to the valley of the Great Salt Lake fulfilled a prophecy by Joseph Smith in 1842 when he said, I prophesied that the saints would continue to suffer much affliction and would be driven to the Rocky Mountains to become a mighty people. The memories of Nauvoo's noble beginnings still burn brightly. Thank you for letting us share them with you tonight. Saturday, April 17th, partly sunny and warmer. Yeah. <laughs> 
And that's very sturdy still. Can we get two? Can you guys scoot over just a little bit? And here comes the the prisoners received a few visitors. They also read, conversed, and wrote letters. Joseph wrote to his wife. Dear Emma, I am very much resigned to my lot, knowing I am justified and have done the best that could be done. Give my love to the children and all my friends, and may God bless you all. By afternoon, the mood grew somber. Joseph asked John Taylor to sing a favorite hymn. A poor wayfaring man of grief hath often crossed me on my way who suits so humbly for relief that I saints were stunned. Joseph and Hiram were gone. John Taylor and Willard Richards survived to bear this witness. Joseph lived great, and he died great in the eyes of God and his people. And like most of the Lord's anointed in ancient times, has sealed his mission and his works with his own blood. And so has his brother Hiram. In life they were not divided, and in death they were not separated.
question is, they use that for a weather van. Well, that's why it was that way. It's starting to rain. Downlands. I just gave it away. So what's on top of Angel Moroni's head? Don't answer. Just think about it. Don't answer that. Because these were stones that came from a local quarry right here and were hauled up here by wagon. But all these stones were left, and those are valuable building tools in those days. You couldn't just go to a stone yard and buy stones. 69th Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, April 4th, 1999. He said, I feel impressed to announce that among all the temples we are constructing, we plan to rebuild the Nauvoo Temple. A member of the a church and his family have family provided, have a, very provided a very substantial contribution to make this possible. We are grateful to him. It will be a while before it happens, but the architects have begun their work. This temple will not be busy much of the time. It will be somewhat isolated, but during the summer months we anticipate it will be very busy and the new building will stand as a memorial to those who built the first such structure there on the banks of the Mississippi. By this great temple, the after, standing here after the first, for the It's really exciting for me. I'm glad to be here. Uh, we were in the stake center over here when that announcement was given. Now in the Sunday afternoon session of conference, occasionally a brother or sister will nod a little bit. Right? <laughs> right? I mean, let's, let's face it. That as soon as he read the last part of that first paragraph, there was instant clapping, really? shouting, shouting, and crying for about five minutes. In a, in a state center? Yes. In a chapel? Yes. I've never seen that. I've never seen that. <laughs> but I can't think of a better reason. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and after, after that service, people came over here and gathered around the font. Excuse me. They broke out into instant song. We thank you, O oh God, for a prophet. And yeah, it was a nice sunny day. It was like this. It was a nice sunny day. That was special. That was really special. So this is this is the site of the temple. We all know how important temples are. Some of you, all of you young people, have some great blessings awaiting you when you get to go to the temple and see all the time and all the time. Five years. Oh, what a good man. Uh, Dr. James Leroy Kimball from Salt Lake City. I think he's probably dead by now, but uh, uh, for a few years back. But I'm Hugh Kimball, a son of uh, Hugh Moffat Kimball. And he was the son of Joshua Kimball. Joshua Kimball was, to my understanding, was the last born boy of Heber C. Kimball's. And he was born to Heber C. Kimball and Sarah Ann Whitney. Sarah Ann uh, Whitney and Heber C. Kimball were married for time in Utah in 1848. Her parents were also members of a specific company that uh, they all came 
to Utah with. Bishop Whitney did not live long after reaching the valley. He died in 1850. The children of Sarah Ann and President Kimball were David and David O, both who died in infancy. David Heber, Newell Whitney, Horace Heber, Maria, and Joshua, my great-grandfather, who was the last boy to be born to Heber C. Kimball. Six years they lived in um, a uh, covered wagon, wagon boxes, tents, and little log cabins that had water on the floor when it rained until they got to Salt Lake. He never, he never did uh, waver as far as his testimony went, I think, that, which to me is, you know, really adds a, a lot of strength to the testimony of the truthfulness of the gospel a person to be tested the way some of these early members of the church were just really is very convincing of the truthfulness of their testimony which of course passes on down to us so you're related how to joseph smith senior Go inside. Nice tasting down over here. That's nice. Oh. We've been waiting for you. I wonder what happened. Now, tell me about this, Paul. What's this here? Is, uh, I call this fried spaghetti. I pre-cook the spaghetti and then put it in the frying pan. I fry it with the sauce, a little uh, garlic, a little olive oil, and Romano cheese, imported Romano cheese. Imported Romano cheese. What kind of chicken do you call this? Is your chicken you know what it has an What's the name of this Italian chicken? That's just Italian breaded chicken. Yeah, Italian breaded chicken. Chicken breaded. On these walls are the names of those who died before their journeys end. In addition to these, <clears throat> others died who are lost from our records, but are remembered unto the Savior.
about a year before his death, he said, I am like a huge rough stone rolling down from a high mountain. And the only polishing I get is when, is when some corner comes in contact with something else, striking the accelerated force of religious bigotry, priestcraft, lawyercraft, buying editors, judges, jurors, backed by mobs, blasphemers, and corrupt men and women. Thus I shall become a smooth and polished chap in the quiver of the Almighty, who will give me dominion over all of them. In March of 1844, about three months before his death, death, the prophet made this interesting statement. He said, you don't know me. You never knew my heart. No man knows my history. I cannot tell it. I shall never undertake it. I don't blame any man for not believing my history. If I had not experienced what I have, I would not have believed it myself. The prophet then concluded by saying, when I call by the trump of the archangel, Weighed in the balance, you will all come in. before I love you. I leave my blessing and my testimony of this great and wonderful Latter-day work. God be with you till we meet six months from now. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.